start time, and today I'm going to give you a presentation about Zillage, which is the terminal multiplexer, and it's also what you see here on the slide, so this is the logo. Unfortunately, I didn't get it in color yet. The software betrayed me, but I'll do better next time. Um, first thing, um, I want to make sure um, you all understand it. I'm a Zillage core maintainer, so I'm probably biased. So, yeah, that's life. Um, and this is beta software. So while Zellich is uh, about two years old now, uh, it still has a lot of bugs in it, its software, and uh, it's not considered very stable yet. So that's why it's beta. But from my personal experience, I have to say it's very stable and reliable. Um, I wouldn't say mission critical, but you can figure that out for yourself. Um, and what I want to do today is I'll give you a quick introduction to what Zellich is and where it comes from. Then I'll give you an application walkthrough and I'll put a little emphasis on the layout system in Zellich. Um, we'll see more about that later. Um, a few more things, uh, the content that I'm showing you here will be made available on GitLab. I didn't make it in time, so it's not there yet, but I'll do so on the weekend. Uh, the presentation is also written in Markdown and all the software is packaged into a container, so ideally it should run exactly the same on your PC so you can try it all. Um, I'll show you a vanilla, a vanilla Zellich setup. Um, there are a lot of things you can configure and customize about it, um, but I'll just give you the plain version. And since it's going to deal a lot with key bindings, here's a quick manual on how to read these key bindings. Um, so let's go. Um, Zellich itself started out in 2021. And uh, the lead developer and project initiator is Aaron Verwekening, who takes a very, very active part in developing it uh, even today. It's written in Rust, and the goal is to become a terminal workspace. Now, I know terminal workspace is a rather vague term, which is sort of intentional, because Aram in particular has lots of ideas in his head uh, where he wants to drive the project. And we also develop a lot of features based on user input and feedback, of course. So if anyone has a good idea, then we're always open to discuss it and add it to the application. It was originally named Mosaic, now it's called Zellich. And a fun fact, actually, Zellich is a style of Mosaic, which is today very common in Morocco. Um, it's developed on GitHub, it's open source, so you can join in if you want. And there's documentation and more available on the website. And there's the first example. Whatever. Um, just a tip, if you try it at home, if you click the links once, you'll see the actual URL and you can go there. So, <clears throat> um, features um, it has is, on the basic level, it's a terminal multiplexer. You may have guessed that by now, I guess. Um, it uses panes, which are organized in tabs. So here I have a single tab, a pane, which takes up the whole tab. Um, these panes can be resized, moved, and made to float too. We'll see how in a minute. Uh, it has a, I think, rather sophisticated layout system, which I'm also going to show you later on. Uh, it has a plugin system with WASM based plugins. So you can program plugins in any language you like as long as it compiles to WASM in the end. And it has a rich UI out of the box, so it comes with batteries included if you want to put it like that. And it also displays hints at the bottom, for example. So you no longer have to scroll through a long list of key bindings or memorize all of them. Um, the basics at the top here, we see the tab bar, um, it highlights the current tab, so I open a new tab, then uh, here I have another tab. So um, it also reacts to mouse events, so I can click here, I can go there and go back, which is also very handy, I figured out recently, on touch-based devices, so if you have a touch device, you can um, operate the tab bar like that too. Um, at the bottom we have the status bar. It highlights the current input mode, so that's the first line we see down below. And in the second line it shows tips um, and node specific key bindings. So when I'm in normal mode, which is the regular input mode, um, I see tips. The, we have a few tips, um, they vary, and then if I enter different modes, I see the key bindings there. So I press N now, for example, I create a um, and there are some basic key bindings that are available in pretty much all modes. Um, so to quickly create a new pane, you press all of them. So I can demo that here, and then I can close it again. I can move between panes with uh, 
H, J, K, and L. Um, arrow keys work too, I think. Yes, they do. Uh, I don't use them. And you can increase um, and decrease paints with uh, Alt, Plus, and Minus. So uh, for creating a pin, you can, I can resize it, make it smaller, and close it again. So um, now we're going to walk through the modes quickly. There's the locked mode, which is the first in the status part at the bottom. It does pretty much nothing. Uh, it's mostly handy when uh, you have an application focus that has key bindings that collide with the ZLH key bindings because, as you see, there are plenty. So we have eight key bindings with control keys. And it's also very handy when nesting ZLH sessions. So, for example, you can lock the outer session, and then in the pane, you have another ZLH session running, and all the key bindings will be forwarded to that. So, essentially, when ZLH is locked, it doesn't accept any key bindings except for the key binding to be the lock. Next, we have the pain mode. Um, we can access pain mode with Control P, and um, there are key bindings available in pain mode that we already saw. So I can press N to create a new pain. Then I can press X to close it again. Um, if I have a pain, then I can rename it, for example. So here's a cool name. Um, I can create a new pane in a specific direction, so I'm mostly using Alt-N, but if I press D, for example, I'm going to create a new pane below my currently focused pane, and then I can also create a new pane to the right if I want to. Of course, here the pane has become a bit small, which is unhandy. Um, I can make a pane full screen, so that's pretty cool if you want to quickly you know, open your editor in a split mode or whatever, and then while I'm in full screen, I can also navigate panes. Yes, please. Question. If you move a um, pane into full screen, does it does it change the size of the other panes? Uh, the other panes are pretty much suppressed or hidden. Okay. The Just did not also expand it because it's no longer there. Uh, no. <clears throat> um, then you can also toggle pane frames. So if you're a Tmax user, you're probably more used to this sort of layout. That's available too. And uh, finally, there's also a quick key binding to focus the next pane, which is just P. Um, but that's not all. We have another special, or there's a bonus to tile panes actually, um, because as long as you don't name a pane, it understands ANSI sequences to re rename a terminal. I don't know if you ever came across those. Some applications change the name of your terminal, and uh, our panes understand that too. So, for example, if I copy this command, I enter it into my terminal over here. So currently it has the default name, pane number two, and now it says hello terminal. So if you're writing terminal applications yourself, maybe you could want to include this. I, for example, did this in the build system for Zellich, and then it prints at the top the step it's currently building. Um, then we have another other type of panes, which are floating panes. They work the same as regular panes. Uh, the difference is just where you find them. Uh, we open floating pane mode essentially by pressing Control P and then W by default, and then I have a new floating pane. And now I can also create some new floating panes. I can close them. I can rename them to floating. Um, and if I want to hide them again, I press Control P and W again. But it's it's just hidden, so it, it doesn't destroy itself when I do that. So I can toggle it again, and I can create more of them, and I can toggle it back, and they're gone. And uh, it's very handy depending on how you like to use it. So I, for example, uh, find very handy to run you know, one-off commands, for example. And what we can also do is we can embed these panes with E by default, then it's a tile pane again, and then we can make it a floating pane by pressing E again in pane one. So much for floating panes. Um, the paints can overlap, as we saw. They can be moved with a mouse too. Yeah, I always forget that one. Uh, so if you click the border here, you can move it around. Um, and if you click next to a floating pane, you go back to tile mode. So here, it's back into tile mode. A question, yes, please. Can you resize them? Yes, we, you can. And we'll see how in a minute. Next up, we have tabs. Um, so I already created a new tab, tab number two here. Um, I'm currently wondering why it's... Oh, right, okay. Yeah, Control T and N, and then that creates a new tab. Now I'm wondering why it's always the same tab. Um, we'll figure that out in a minute. So, 
this is a tab, that's what it's like, uh, sort of when you create it. And uh, we can close tabs just the same as we close panes. We can rename them. And then we can also sync the input of all panes in a tab. This is sort of a fun feature. I, I regularly use it when I want to dip directories. So for example, I like to use PostgreFS snapshots to uh, regularly store my file system snapshots. And uh, then sometimes I find it very handy to you know, go into my current file system state and go into the last snapshot and then just CD in parallel through the file system trees. Uh, but you can also do fun things with it, of course. Uh, so uh, there's one parrot. Uh, and then you can sync the tab. And then we have two parrots. So, or whatever else you can make up. size mode, uh, so we can increase the size of a pane in a specific direction, so when I create a new pane here, and I enter a resize mode with Control m I can resize it to the left, for example, and then I can resize it into the other direction. Now it seems my terminal has crashed, so never mind that, we'll just start over um, here, and uh, actually that's still in a new tab, so if that crashes out of here. Here I have a new tab, and then I can resize my planes. And uh, what's also cool is um, you can just resize in one direction. So for example, say I have the middle pane here, so pane number one is currently highlighted. And now I can resize it to the left, of course, but how do I make it smaller? So uh, you press Shift and H, for example, to make it smaller from the left side. So that way you're pretty flexible with term in terms of resizing panes. And you can also use just the generic plus and minus to make it resize in a particular, or in a generic direction. Um, <coughs> the same works for floating panes too, yes. So here I have a pane, and then I can resize it to the top, bottom, to make it smaller. And for example, if I make an increasing resize to the right, and it's at the screen boundary, it's going to become smaller from the other side. So it has a sort of natural feel, if you can call it that. And uh, <coughs> another thing that's worth mentioning in particular is that if I have a sophisticated layout such as this, so I have a grid now, and there's clearly there's a center point, so there's an intersection in the middle, and now if I do a resize with uh, Alt plus, so just into generic resize, it's going to maintain that center intersection, um, which can be very handy at some at times. Good. Next, um, so these are the things that I already said. Next, we can move panes too. Um, so say I open a new pane here, and then I enter move mode, and then I can swap them, for example. Um, this becomes more of an interesting feature if you have a lot of panes, or for example, if you have floating panes. You can also move floating panes around, of course. Um, and then you can also change focus while in moving mode, so for convenience. And that's about all we have to say about that. Um, next feature that I personally very would like is uh, searching. So I think everyone who works in a terminal has experienced at some point that if you do something like, I don't know, here, this is all the content in Etsy, so we have 1,126 lines of output now. I can, of course, take the mouse and scroll up all the way, but I'm not gonna, probably not going to find what I was looking for unless I do grab. Um, what we can also do is search, and then I can, for example, scroll here with the keyboard through a scroll buffer. I can also um, open the current, um, that didn't work now, so um, if I had an editor configured, which I don't have in this container, obviously, I can also press E and then it's going to open the whole scroll buffer in a temporary file in whatever editor I have configured in my environment. Um, so if you want to, you know, do fancy editing with your scroll buffer, go ahead. You can also enter search terms with S, and uh, you see at the top, then it changes the title that says searching, and then you enter the term. So now, if I search for net, for example, I can use P to search up the scroll buffer for all occurrences of net in the output. And then there are certain search options, so I can make it case insensitive, I can make it wrap search, and I can search for whole words too. So for example, yeah, there are a few matches for whole words, uh, for some definition of whole word. And uh, that's uh, search mode, pretty much. So 
Ja. Um, <coughs> these are the key bindings after a search term has been entered. Uh, we have a session, so if I press Ctrl O, I enter session mode, and the only key binding I have here is to detach. Um, so what this does essentially is it's going to keep the session running, it's going to drop me into a shell, um, and then at some later point I can reattach. So Tmux, for example, does this too, which is one of the essential reasons to use terminal multiplexes if you work on a service, for example, or any remote site, because it's just going to remember your session until you close it, for example, which we do here with the close mode. Um, and sessions will persist until quit. They can be named too, but if, unfortunately only by creating them. So my session here is named Selich Demo. You see that in the top left um, in the tab bar. You can list sessions while you're in the command line. Um, so um, I open the here, then I can do this OS, and here is my session. And I can also attach to it, but I can also kill the session, of course, if it's stuck for some reason. Um, quit mode, you can figure that one out for yourself. I'm not going to demo it now. Um, next feature I want to highlight are command panes. So the Zellich executable um, has a subcommand that's called run, uh, which can do lots of cool things. And command panes are a special type of pane that are specialized in running a command. So, for example, um, a uh, very common use case is, say you have an editor open to the left, and then you have your make or whatever in a pane to the right of it, and then you make some changes, and then you go into the, to the neighboring pane, and then you press the up arrow to go to the last command, and you hit enter to make a build or run your tests or something like that. And command panes are mostly a convenience thing, so what they do is they run a single command, um, and you start that by hitting enter, so all you have to do is go to the other pane, hit enter, it's going to run, and uh, you get all the benefits of the Zedich panes. So for example, you can enter search mode, you can scroll through the pane with the keyboard, you can search in search mode for specific keywords, and uh, you can also um, start panes in suspended, so I'll demo that now. So if you say I do Zedich run, I want to open that new pane below the current pane, um, I'm going to give it a name, it's just called foo, and I will start it suspended, then I do a double dash to separate the commands so it doesn't get confused, and then I can do an ls here again. Now, you see here we have a new pane, the name is foo, and at the bottom, that's a, that's a special part, it says enter to run, or control c to exit. And uh, I told it to start in suspend, so now if I hit enter, it's going to run the command, and then I can just rerun it by pressing enter again. And it's also going to show me the exit mode, uh, very prominently at the bottom. So this is very convenient, for example, in conjunction with the stack panes, which we're also going to get to. And then I can close that again, close this, and then we continue. We have a mechanism to script the application, it's called Zellich Action. Um, the primary, primary method of interaction are key bindings, um, but there are rather a limited amount of keys that you can bind things to. And um, there are a lot of actions, actually, you can bind to these keys. And also, um, many applications need their own set of keys for interactions. And besides, I think, personally, that scripting, something like keyboard input to send to a specific application feels pretty weird. Um, so we have this action mechanism. And all the actions that you can bind to a key are available from the CLI. So you can literally write a bash script and then detect it running in a Zellich session and perform a Zellich action uh, to switch tabs or whatever. <clears throat> and uh, here's an example to open a new tab with a given layout, which I already used. Um, so I showed that here already. So action, new tab. And then we can also type help to see what action options it has, avail has available at all. And uh, yeah open new tabs like this, for example. Good. <clears throat> um, Zellich can be extended with plugins. As I said, they can be written in any language which compiles to WASM. Um, user plugins that we know of currently exist written in Rust and in Zip. We also support Rust, so it's part of, of the repository too, and it's maintained. Um, Zip, we have a contributor who is very active in Zip, and he takes care of that part. Um, there are four plugins bundled in the application. 
There's the status bar in the tab bar, which we see they're part of the default layout. Then there's the compact bar, which is sort of a hybrid between the status and the top bar. Because many people come to us, they say, oh, it takes up so much space on the screen. So it tries to combine these into one UI element. And then we also have Strider, um, which I can demo here. So I think I have the layout somewhere available. Yes. So there's a new tab now, and Strider is essentially a, a file browser. Uh, it's opened here on the left. Personally, I don't really use Strider, uh, but I know we have a few users that do very actively, and so that's available as a plugin too. But there are others. Um, there are a few third party plugins by users, so these are part of the application, and um, you can write it all. And um, there's an API, and we're always looking for cool ideas to help us shape this API. It's still in a pretty raw state, and we're mostly just adding things where we feel like, oh, you know, our status bar could use, for example, dynamic key bindings to react to changes in the configuration, so that's when we last edited the API. But if you have an idea for something that might fit into a plugin, just don't hesitate to contact us, and then we're happy to discuss it. Um, however, the plugin system will likely undergo pretty major rewrite for the next release. It's not certain yet, but uh, the last few releases focused mostly on configuration language and the layout system, which we'll get to in a second. And the next releases will probably focus on the plugin system because there are a few, uh, few problems that we ran into in recent versions and we want to clean up this part of the code now. <clears throat> um, configuration, I already managed village can be configured in a variety of ways. The configuration is written in Cuddle. Um, you've probably never heard of it before today. Uh, the goal of Cuddle is to look and read like a list of CLI commands. Personally, I think it does that job pretty well, and I've come to like it quite much. We know that we have a lot of users that have strong opinions about this topic, and they don't like it, but yeah, you can make up your minds for yourself, I think. Um, there's a global configuration directory, and that includes the main configuration file, which includes, for example, key bindings or even a bit of theming. Um, it includes layouts and swap layouts. We'll get to that in a second. And we're also planning to add um, a folder where you can place all your themes, for example. So if you want to write your themes into separate files, that will be possible too in a future release. Um, here's an excerpt from the default config. So this is a portion of the key bindings. And you can see we have key binds, and then we have the different modes. For example, there's lock mode, and then I bind control G to the action, which is called switch to mode normal. So that's while I'm in locked mode, if I press Control G, I will switch to normal mode. Um, and go on like this for all our modes and our key bindings. And uh, next I want to go uh, or introduce you to our layout system. Layouts, just like the configuration, are written in Cuddle. And uh, here's the default layout, so pretty short. Uh, most of it is actually the plugins. So at the top we have a size 1, which means it's a single line on the terminal, uh, the plugin tab bar, and then at the bottom we have in two lines the status bar, and in between we have pane. And pane is just a naked pane, um, but it doesn't have to be, so you can, for example, enrich panes um, with additional attributes. Uh, here, for example, we have a command pane which runs ls minus l minus r slash etsy. It has the name list files, and it will start suspended. And I've this, so um, I think I called it ex1, yeah, so there's the layout, um, here you can see now, we didn't specify the plugins, so there's no tab bar and there's no status bar, which doesn't mean they're gone, you just have to know your key bindings and you can go back to where you've been. Um, and then I can run this and I can close it, and because it's the only pane in the layout, uh, when I close it, the tab closes too. <clears throat> okay. Um, now imagine you write in a sophisticated layout, maybe including multiple tabs even, so that's an option too. Um, and you're probably going to have very recurring panes. So I, for example, have an energy pane that I have in almost every tab, or a shell pane. Um, and we have pane templates for that, so you don't have to repeat everything 50 times over. Um, so at the top here, I define a pane template, for example, I call the editor. I tell you which commands to run, and then at the bottom, um, I open a container pane, so it's a pane which has a split direction vertical, so that's just a container to 
help with the layout. And then I open two editor panes in that. I call them A and B. And we can have a look at that too. So that's what this looks like. Um, there's a vertical split, which means there's a vertical line in between A and B, as I define it in the layout. And then here again, I didn't define the plugins, so I have to know the key bindings. <coughs> okay. And uh, last pretty major feature about layouts are swap layouts. They're one of the new key features in the most recent Zelda release, which is from Tuesday this week. And the idea is to rearrange visible panes in an intelligent manner. Now, intelligent means mostly you're going to have to tell it how. Um, still, it's available at the press of a button. And the idea is that you provide a set of configurable swap layouts and the layout system is going to try to make something useful out of it. Um, they are mapped by default to alt and uh, brackets. It doesn't work if you only have a single pane. So for example, here, if I open a few new panes, you see at the bottom right in the status bar, there's a new hint now. It says alt and brackets, and next to that it says vertical. Vertical is a name that I assign to the swap layout, so that's one of the defaults. Then if I hit that, hit these buttons, it's going to rearrange the panes in interesting ways. And here we see one of the other new key features in the new release, which are stack panes. So I already hinted at that. And now I can, for example, open a new command pane here. And then, because I can't think of anything better, I'm going to use files again. Okay, here it can't split. Uh, let's see, how is this? Yeah, there. And what's cool now about command panes is, um, I see in the stack here I can move up. And uh, for every command pane I see in the bottom of it, even if it's minimized, the exit code, and I see the name at the bottom, um, too. So how I like to use it personally is at work. Um, I have to develop C++ code, which sometimes takes a while to compile. So I just switch over to the compile tab, then hit enter to make it run, and then go do something else in my other panes. And then I can see the exit code, and if it passes, I immediately go to flash it onto my embedded target, and otherwise I go back to the editor to fix whatever I broke. And because it's a command pane, I can just go in here and then use search mode to check the errors I got. <coughs> Here's a, a, a sneak peek on how you define these. So you can define a tab template similar to how you do uh, paint templates. And then we have a special node which is called swap tile layout. And then you have certain keywords. They're uh, explained in more detail in the documentation. You can say that a specific swap layout applies only if you have at most five panes, or for example, at least three panes. The same also works, uh, I haven't shown that yet, for floating panes. So um, here we can, now they're staggered, uh, now they're enlarged, and now they're spread, for example. Um, so that's very convenient, I think. And then the last feature um, that I want to highlight is multiplayer mode, or at least that's what we call it when we, when we announced it. Um, the idea is um, you don't have to work alone in your terminal, so you can just open a second one. <clears throat> Only if I weren't so nervous, I wouldn't have blocked my laptop while trying to do that. So um, it's running in a container, as I said, so I have to do some container magic. And then we attach it to the session with demo. Now that didn't work because so I have a typo again. There. Um, I'm going to make it larger. So <clears throat> now we have both terminals are connected to the same session. And this is actually pretty fun if you'd like to do you know, cooperative coding because um, Zelich can handle this just fine. So the idea is essentially you open two editor panes and then each of you gets one pane and then you can hack on the same piece of code, for example. So, that's just one of the ideas. Um, unfortunately, I haven't really gotten around to testing it out yet because I haven't really had a friend yet to try it with, but I definitely plan to because I think it's a very fun feature. Yes, please? As one of the pain points of a Tmux user, how does it deal with differently sized terminals in multiplayer mode? Yeah, I think you just saw that. So, for example, if I make this one smaller, 
It takes just limited to the smallest one. Yes, it takes the smallest screen size and renders all the other screens the same. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> exactly. So if I make this one smaller, for example, then or larger, in that case, the other one becomes smaller too. Yeah, and that about wraps it up. Um, so thanks for your attention. And do you have any further questions? Did you try to <coughs> did you try to start dwarf fortresses in it? What what did you dwarf fortress? Does it run this in it in the multiplayer mode? No, because it was a pain with T Max. <laughs> Not yet, no. <laughs> no more questions. Alright, then you know, check it out if you like. Give us feedback. We're always open to suggestions and we are happy to have new users to help us develop new features and so thanks.